Good morning. Thank you so much for joining New Spirit Online. You're in for a great time. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So get your Bible, tune your ear, and get ready to take notes. A life-changing word is on the way. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so this morning. Listen, take a few minutes to just worship the Lord in your own way. Go to two or three people and greet them in the name of the Lord on this morning. Go to somebody that you didn't come in with, someone whose name you don't know, and let them glad, know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord on this morning. Amen. Pray to me. Come on, go to somebody that you don't know. Greet them in the name of the Lord. We don't have to do social distancing anymore. Fellowship one with another. Glory, glory. Prophesy to that person you're fellowshipping with. Just tell them God said you're going to be all right. Give him praise. Give God praise right there. It's December 17th already. Christmas Eve is next Sunday. Uh, my wife and others were, she was on that. She was on that ain't no snow stuff the other day. <laughs> ah, ain't no snow for Christmas. I said, don't start that. <laughs> Did this stuff last year and then it came in. I said, act like you live in Florida then. <laughs> or, or somewhere, Arizona. Just pretend you live somewhere where there is no snow because I don't miss it. Say amen. You do? Oh, okay, good. I'm glad. No, I don't miss it. I can remember walking to school <laughs> with snow up here. Kids think you're lying. But then when you realize your legs wasn't but this long anyway, in the third grade, we had to walk to school. <laughs> had no bus, <laughs> wasn't no ride. <laughs> it was one car in the family and the old man went to work in it. And I had to walk home for lunch and walk back after lunch, and then walk back home again after school was out. And to be quite honest, I lived a long way, too. Because I had to go to school out of my neighborhood. All I know is, when I was like in the first grade, they took me to the psychiatrist, tested me, and sent me to another school. My wife said, yeah, they sent you to the special needs school. <laughs> she said, 
Yes, he did. Yeah, they tested you all, right? <laughs> Amen. But um, let's go on to the word of God. St. John chapter 1. I'm trying to pull the message up. I'm having a problem. St. John chapter 1. I don't know if the stream is coming through or not. Is it? I'm going to make sure. Well, I ain't got it. <laughs> I threw my phone last week. How many of y'all done threw your phone before? I threw it last week. And immediately after it left my hand, I tried to catch it. No. St. John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, verses 10 and 11, and then verse 14. All right, we lie. Great. Let's read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made, and Him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, bless us this morning through our reception of your word, and we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Marcus is texting me while I'm up here supposed to be preaching. <laughs> Y'all love the Lord. Today, more than any other time in recent history, there is no more controversial a question in the religious and non-religious sphere. There's no more controversial a question in the secular and the spiritual sphere than the question of the divinity of Jesus Christ, the question of was Jesus God? And that is a question that is a fundamental fact of the Christian faith. You know, I've been dialoguing and debating with some regarding Islam recently. And it surprises me the number of Christians or professed or supposed Christians that um, endeavor to state that the Muslims and the Christians worship the same God. No, they don't. Yes, they do. They said, well, the name Allah simply means God. I said, no, it doesn't. The word Allah is the Arabic word for God. Allah was the name of one of a number of pagan deities. The one that Muhammad chose as his God. He went to the Kaaba. The Kaaba was a, a, where they had a pantheon. I think it was 72 gods in there. And Muhammad said, out of all the 72, he had Allah as his, his choice. Uh, he was a pagan God that predated Islam. They argue with me. You don't know, it's the same God. I said, is Allah the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? If he ain't, shut up. <laughs> Supposed Christians. The one, the one going to tell me, told me I was dumb. Said, you know, Abraham had two kids. And they chose two different paths to the same God. I said, man, you sound. Don't make me have to call you a name on you. Sound ridiculous. I said, Isaac and 
Ishmael didn't choose two different paths to the same God. What are you talking about? Uh, Ishmael predated Islam by thousands of years. He didn't found it, and Isaac actually predated Judaism. So stop this stuff. You know, I, it was kind of startling to me the number of supposed Christians that believed that that you know uh, uh, they were this, we worship the same God. And I said, unless Islam states that Jesus is God come in the flesh, then there is no similarity. Amen. I said, Allah is no more God than Baal or Moloch or anybody else. Amen. And so that is the basis of, or the basis for the authenticity of Christianity, that which separates Christianity from any and all other world religions, the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he was manifest in the flesh at what we have termed the incarnation, which is the act and the fact of divinity assuming humanity of God becoming man. Amen. More precisely, amen, uh, it, it, you know, you can see stories about uh, in, in different myths and fables about men becoming gods, but you never see God becoming man. And that is what the observance of Christmas really is all about. Even though, you know, I kind of miss, you know, I, I'm going to be honest, it doesn't feel Christmassy in America. Amen. Where, where Frosty at? Where Rudolph? No, I grew up, when I grew up, we could, we could tell, you know, Mr. Jingling was out in these streets. I remember they used to have the old Federal's department store up on Lee Road in the Lee Harvard Plaza. Santa Claus was sitting there giving out peppermints. I walked past Santa Claus 35 times. Every time you walk by, he'd, 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 he'd break you off. I wasn't sitting in his lap, though. Higby's downtown, and they were down there, and you could go see the displays, and you would have the Norelco Razor commercials and Burl Ives singing and we watched Rudolph well we don't even get the Charlie Brown Christmas anymore amen uh, I mean but that's you know those are just some traditional trappings but the incarnation is actually um, the theme of Christmas God becoming man and coming to the planet earth to live and to move and to walk and to talk and to act among men now so the deity of Jesus Christ is a very important question today. I really am amazed, you know, some things we take for granted until you find yourself exposed to a number of other different people. And I really am amazed about the number of atheists and agnostics that are in America today. It's, it's kind of surprising, you know, when you be on social media, you find out there's a bunch of dumb, stupid people on there. And it's a bunch of you know, those that endeavor to undermine the Christian faith and those that actually just dispute Christianity. The agnostics all throughout this country, the agnostics say, I don't know. And that's just a cop out. And they say, but you're going to find out. And you got the atheists that are out here as well that simply do not believe in the Lord. And so it's an important question today because of the attacks being made upon it. Now the attacks upon Jesus Christ's divinity primarily flow along four different lines. The first line being, amen, the question of Jesus' existence at all. Some people endeavor to regard him as simply a mythological figure, that he's a tall tale, he's a fable, like Paul Bunyan or, or somebody like that. And, you know, that he really didn't exist. But there is uh, an, an easy, amen, uh, counter to that argument by the fact that there are a number of extra biblical references to the Lord, amen, as well as the fact that all four of the Gospels can stand the test, amen. Uh, they can hold up under scrutiny and stand the test of whether or not they are legitimate historic documents, amen. There, 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 there's more historic documentation of the authenticity of the Gospels than any other piece of literature from the ancient world in existence. You have to understand, the very first biography of Alexander the Great was written 400 years after he died. 
and they hold that up as legitimate. While the gospels were written, amen, in the lifetime of those that walked and talked and lived with Jesus, amen. Too many eyewitnesses, Paul even said when he was talking about the uh, book of Corinthians, he said he was seen by 500 witnesses, amen. And, and, and if you don't believe it, uh, most of them are still alive today. You don't believe me, go ask them, go talk to them. So there are a number of extra biblical references to Jesus, amen. Scholars today, secular scholars, amen, will admit that a man known of, of as Jesus of Nazareth did indeed live in the first century and that his life was the source of a number of reports which circulated about him. Amen. The Jewish historian Josephus mentions Jesus in his writings. Amen. The Roman historian Tacitus mentions Jesus in his writings as well as the Roman governor Pliny. He mentioned him as well. Even the Jewish Talmud, even though they said things about him, amen, that uh, were not true. They did at least testify to his, amen, uh, his living, amen. And so the first line of attack was those that say, well, he never did even really exist, which that could be easily disputed. The next line of attack is that, yes, Jesus was indeed divine saints of God. But, you know, uh, some say, well, all men are divine. We all are. Yeah. Now, now then what, what happens is they take a bigger view of mankind. They say that Jesus was a God, just like all other men are God. Say amen. And they say that in light of the fact that man was, amen, man is indeed made in the image and the likeness of God that man does have divine potentialities and divine possibilities by nature of being inbreathed by the spirit of the Lord at creation. But if Jesus was divine in the same sense that man is, then he was not God at all. Help me, Holy Ghost. He was just a super man, amen, a beefed up man. And how many of you know there's a tremendous difference between a super man and the almighty God? Help me, Holy Ghost. And so that was the second line of attack, a bigger view of man. The third line of attack regarding Jesus' divinity is that of a smaller view of Jesus, a reduction in his person by those who attempt to discredit and explain away all of his miracles. You know, you have those that endeavor to explain his miracles away. And if they can explain away his miracles, they can reduce him to the level of all other men. I was reading some nonsense not too long ago about through some people that were trying to discredit, an author that was trying to discredit discredited his miracles and they said what well, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves of fishes was not that Jesus actually multiplied them they said the miracle was that a spirit of sharing a spirit of generosity came upon the people and they just began to share with each other what they had. And so, there ain't no miracle. What are you talking about? You know, they tried to, amen, explain away the miracles, amen, and discredit any elements or aspects of the supernatural that were in and upon his life. Then the fourth line of attack is that of endeavoring to diminish his deity. First of all, once again, they question his existence. Then others try to make a bigger view of man. Others try to make a smaller view of Jesus. Then they try to diminish his divinity by stating that rather than being God, he was just God-like. He was just good, amen. He was a very good man that God is just a word for good. You know, the Islam tries to say, well, he was a prophet, yes, but he wasn't God. There are others that say, well, he was a good man. He was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. And they'll say that the root meaning of good is the root meaning of God that Jesus was good, that they will even admit that he was without sin, without practice of sin, that there was no element of sin in him, and then that, that therefore his sinlessness made him the God, or the, they call God being the perfect good. But that theory will make Adam a God. Amen. Now, until he fell out of Eden, which is what Mormonism teaches. Uh, Mormonism says as, as man is, God was. As God is, man shall become. And they teach that, they teach that Adam was uh, a God in the sense. Amen. Because 
know, they, they, they would make Adam a God. But if Jesus was God only in the sense that he was not guilty of any actual sin, then his Godhood would be predicated upon his continued sinlessness. You understand? Which would make it his Godliness fragile in the same sense as Adam's because it does not do away with his sinful potential. Amen. See, Adam was sinless, but he was sinless in a mutable state. Amen. He was a sinless, but he was capable of sin. And they see Jesus in that same way. Amen. A great teacher, a mighty prophet, but still uh, just a good man that was capable, a sinless man that was capable of sin. So those are the attacks that are made upon the Godhood of Jesus. His existence, a bigger view of man, a smaller view of Jesus, and a distorted, amen, and diluted view of his divinity. Now, if these attacks, amen, on the deity, if these attacks on the Godhood, the divinity of Jesus were to succeed, and as a result, we would have to abandon our faith that Jesus was and Jesus is God Almighty, then what is the natural progression from that? What follows after that? If those attacks are successful, we would once again have to abandon our faith in him, abandon our notion and idea of him being God. What is to follow? If those attacks are successful, if those arguments are successful, then we might as well discard our Bibles. We might as well put our Bibles down or put our Bibles away, leave them up on a shelf somewhere because if Jesus was just a good man, then the Bible is just a good book. Y'all don't want to help me. Uh, it would be just a good book like any and every other good book. It would be no better than Shakespeare or Hamlet's soliloquy. And it will have no more authority in our life than any other book. Uh, it will not be the standard by which we live our lives. I mean, how many of you know the glory of the Bible is not its age, nor is it its style or its historical value or its literary beauty. Uh, the glory of the Bible lies and the fact that it is God's inspired revelation of the origin and the destiny of this world. It's the plan of God for mankind. How many of you know it is the power of God unto salvation? It's God's will to man. It's God's testament to man. The Bible is more than just a good book. It contains the will of man. It declares the state of the will of God and it declares and reveals the state of man and it is the joy, help me Holy Ghost, of the believer. How many of you know I'm right? It contains light to direct. It contains food to nourish and sustain. It contains comfort to encourage. Amen. Uh, James said that it's a mirror to reflect. Jeremiah said it's a hammer to convict and are like a fire shut up in our bones. Peter said that it's seed to multiply and power to create life and godliness. John said that it's a labor to cleanse. Matthew said that it's bread, amen, to the hungry. Isaiah said it's rain to refresh. Hebrew said it's a sword to cut, amen. Psalm said it's like gold to make one rich. Somebody say help him holy ghost Jesus said in the volume of the book it is written of me so if Jesus is reduced from God to simply man then we might as well once again throw our Bibles away and stop coming to church stop worshiping stop praising stop praying because if Jesus is not God then we do not have a savior because if he is not God then he cannot forgive us our sins if Jesus Jesus is not God then we do not have a savior and if we do not have a savior then we do not have salvation if we do not have salvation then we are not saved if Jesus is not God then we have no hope of heaven because if Jesus was not God then he did not raise from the dead if he did not rise then we will not rise and we will rot 
in the grave forever. Somebody shout glory. So if Jesus is not God, we lose our Bible, we lose our Savior, we lose our salvation, we lose heaven, and we lose our heavenly Father. If he is not God, then we lose our faith, we lose our hope, and we are of all men most miserable. Can I keep on going? I promise I won't be long. So then, was Jesus God? Was he God? See, well, see, let me first state this, that miracles are not the proof of his divinity because he never based his claim on the signs that he performed. He didn't say, well, because I'm able to do this or that, you all need to regard me as God. He didn't work miracles for himself. He worked miracles to bless others. The Bible says he went about doing good and, 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 and healing those, amen, and blessing those and delivering those that were bound by the devil. He worked miracles to bless man, not to make a display of his power. He didn't do it for any self-aggrandizement, any self-promotion, amen. And the miracles of his person, his virgin birth, his resurrection are proved by him rather than he being proved by them. Uh, help me Holy Ghost the bottom line then is this either Jesus was God coming to flesh or he wasn't there is no middle ground there is no uh, ambiguousness about it if he was not God then he was either deceived about himself or he deceived other people about himself now was he deceived about himself was he suffering from delusions was he mentally unbalanced was he crazy help me Holy Ghost and there's no evidence that he was can y'all help me I'll preach better I promise on the contrary oh Jesus was poised Jesus was cool calm and collected at all times he was self contained and he was self controlled he was always in possession of himself he was always sound he was always sane he was never worried or anxious he was never stressed out in every position that he took and in every judgment that he formed his mind was help me Holy Ghost was clear and lucid as the light he never was confused he never ever was hesitant he taught profound truth in the simplest of ways he never asked anybody for advice never took counsel from anybody else his words are beyond improvement no one can ever say anything that he said better than he said it he never second guessed himself he never admitted to making a mistake he knew men's thoughts he knew men's character he never regretted his actions he never apologized for anything he said or did he never made excuses he said I am the bread of life he said I am the light of the world he said I am the way I am the truth I am the life I I am the water of life. I am the resurrection and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. And nobody can come to the Father unless they come by me. Help me, Holy Ghost. If he was not God, then he was the biggest liar that ever lived. But there never has been a life as sincere as his. He was truth incarnate. His influence creates integrity in other men. There was never another life like the life he led. Nobody could invent this person. Nobody could make this man up. He was not the type of man, not the type of person that this world could produce. He claimed equality with God. He said he was the Messiah. He said he had power to forgive sin. He said he could give rest. He said that he could lay down his life and take it back up again see some men can choose when to die other people can choose where to die some can even choose how to die but he's the only man that ever lived that could choose whether to die or not to die so we are forced to conclude that Jesus is then God somebody shout glory 
But see, then our mental acceptance of that evidentiary conclusion does not satisfy the human condition. Because saving faith is not the result of a mental process. Saving faith is the result of a life experience. Help me, Holy Ghost. And man discovers that Jesus is God as man comes to know him and endeavors to live for him. The person want to tell me, well, Muslims believe in Jesus. I said, do they believe that he is God come in the flesh? Well, no, then they don't believe in Jesus. Jesus said, if any man will do my will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak for myself. See, Jesus is one that we are to know, not simply one that we are to know about. Come on, talk back to me. Because to only know about him can lead to doubt. But to know him will produce faith in him. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, say, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I'm going to say it for myself. I believe, and I'm going to tell you why. I believe Jesus is God because I believe the Bible. John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Philippians says that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Hebrews called him the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. I believe Jesus was God because Jesus lived like a God should live. If he was just a man, then no other man, why no other man was able to live like him? Well, why was nobody else able to raise the dead? Why nobody else could stop storms? Why can't anybody else turn water into wine? Why has nobody else multiplied loaves and fishes? Why hasn't anybody else walked on water? Why hasn't anybody else resurrected from the dead? He lived the perfect life, the kind of life that God would be expected to live if he was to become a man. Not only did Jesus live like God, he also died like a god he said no man takes my life but i lay it down to him death was not defeat death was a victory it was not a failure it was a complete success it was not a loss of life it was the gain of many lives i believe somebody say i believe that jesus is god because of his humanity he lived like as a man among men he possessed the power of God, but he never used it for himself. He could turn stones into bread, but he never did it to satisfy his own hunger. He called himself the son of man, not because he thought of his divinity, but because he wanted to emphasize his humanity. The Bible says he was in all points tempted, such as we are, but yet, somebody say yet, he was without sin. Somebody say, I believe God and I believe Jesus is God because of what he claims to do he claimed that if we came to him laboring in heavy burden he would give us rest he claimed that if we abide in him and his word abide in us we can ask what we will and it shall be done he claimed to forgive sins he claimed equality with God I believe Jesus is God not only for what he claimed to do but because of what he does because the greatest miracle that he ever did is what he's ever doing he 
saves wretches like me. He makes sinners into saints. He makes liars truthful. He makes harlots virtuous. He makes thieves honest. He makes the dirty clean. He makes the drunks dry. He makes the addicts sober. He makes the sick well. He makes the depressed joyful. He makes the fearful bold. He makes the nervous calm. Somebody say, I believe God for what he does. He gives hope to the hopeless. Companionship to the lonely. He's a friend to the friendless. A father to the fatherless. He lifts the down up. He makes the bad good. He's a way maker. He's a need meter. He's a body healer. He's a mind regulator. He's a bill payer. He's a kidney repair man. He's a protector. He's a provider. He's a physician. He's a shepherd. He's a comforter. He's a very present help. In time of trouble, he is God. Somebody say, he is God. Say, he is God. And he is Lord. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He who was and is and is to come. Shout hallelujah. I told you I wasn't going long. You have to understand. The effect... The effect of Jesus' influence on the world has been too big, been too great, too far reaching. Do you realize his coming divided time? It's more, it's more than just for somebody to, nobody could have invented this guy. His influence has gone on too long and it's still going on on an ever increasing scale. There's no power on earth that can stop it. The gates of hell cannot withstand him. How many of you know he's the hero of the world? There are a lot of things that people can't fully understand or comprehend because nobody can fully understand or comprehend God. And I believe God intentionally reserved amen aspects and facets of himself in order to provoke study of the word. Amen. You may not ever fully understand the virgin birth or the resurrection or the philosophy of redemption. But we do know one thing, and that's that only God can save. We know that it takes the power of God to regenerate a soul. And we know that there's no other salvation, ha! no regeneration, no new birth in any other name other than the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. So was he God? Somebody say, yes, he was. Is he God? Yes, he is. Is he Lord? Yes, he is Lord. And that's the entire idea behind this, this season that we're in, this Christmas season. Jesus is Lord. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He is God, he is Lord, and that's a fact. Stand up on your feet, clap your hands, open up your mouth and give him all the praise. You can give him right now. I don't care what the doubters, the naysayers, the nitpickers or the unbelievers say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He is Lord of all. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Every eye shall see. Every ear shall hear. Every person shall know that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Lift those hands. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent name of Jesus, once again, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the understanding, the light, the enlightenment that accompanies our reception of the entrance of your word. We thank you then, Jesus Christ left heaven, came to this earth in order to redeem us from our sins, to bring us into fellowship with God, to give us a life more abundantly. We thank you that he came, amen, to break the hold of the devil for this purpose. He was manifest, Lord. We thank you to destroy the works of the devil in our lives, individually and collectively. Now, Lord, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice that you continue to do a marvelous work and a wonder in our life. Continue to perfect us and mold us and shape us and refine us and conform us into your image. I pray that you answer the prayers of each and every person in attendance watching online. Answer their prayers in the affirmative. Open doors that no man can close. Bless us with the desires of our heart as a result of the delight that we have in you. You are Lord. We confess it. Improve us, Lord. Continue to work on us and in us. Work by us and through us. And we give you all glory, honor, and praise. And this season especially, we honor and observe your coming to this earth. And we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Say it one more time. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I was debating with some Seventh-day Adventists the other day. They were trying to emphasize the necessity of the Sabbath. And I told them, listen, anything that adds to the finished work of Christ actually takes away from the finished work of Christ. It's not Jesus, the blood of Jesus plus Sabbath keeping that saves us. They got to talking all this Saturday stuff and y'all worshiping on Sunday and Sunday was named after the day of the sun and Constantine changed it, which he didn't. And let y'all know when I try to come with that Constantine nonsense, he didn't change it. In no 325 AD, saints were, early church was observed. In the book of Acts chapter 20, they were meeting in church on, on a Sunday. But they tried to tell me, you, how can you worship on that day? I said, every day of the week is named after a pagan god. That's the case, shut it all down. Or rename them. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they all named after either Norse or Greek or Roman gods. Every day of the week. So... Don't try that one on me. He wanted to worship on Saturday. Saturday is Saturn's day. Friday was Freya Frigga's day, Thor's mother. Thursday, Thor's day. Wednesday, Woden's day. Tuesday, Tur, the God of War, his day. Something like, like some stop that stupid stuff with me. Care what they call the tag on day. They got in an uproar about that statue of Baphomet that was in up in the state legislature in Iowa. And Baphomet in here, and dude went in there and said, I'm a Christian nationalist, went in there with a sword, cut his head off. And they arrested his butt. And now he's in some trouble. And they want everybody to donate to legal defense. I said, yeah, no going, business going in there, messing with that old dumb goat looking statue. I'm defending the Lord. The Bible says, y'all should have no more agreement. I said, I bet he wouldn't have cut a star and crescent down. And that's a bigger emblem of Satan and doggone any old dumb looking goats that you ever was. You ain't gonna do that. You're being selective with your stuff. I said, now when they come in and start tearing down crosses under the same motivation that you had, I ain't trying to hear it. But the Bible says you should have another God before me. Don't make any graven image. I said he was speaking to Israel about having gods in Israel. That's for the people of God. Us people of God shouldn't have no more graven images. I said, okay, well, go, go get married down too while you had it there. Better get that graven image out of there. How they worshiping her? She's human. People just be doing too much sometimes. Out of ignorance. When I say ignorance, I'm not meaning stupidity. Even though it's stupidity involved in some people's ignorance. I mean ignorance is being unlearned and just doing too much. 
we love the Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is our Lord. And we keep our eyes fixed on him. We won't allow any of these other things to distract us. Amen? Amen. Clap your hands one more time. Amen. Listen, we're going to take this time and bless the Lord. I'm going to get you guys out at a good time today through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe right now. Give the Lord our very best offering. Those of you that are watching go online, you can see on the screen, I want you to go to givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com. Text to give, tithely, PayPal. And we're going to honor the Lord, especially at this time. This is the season of giving. Yeah. You know, what, what is kind of disappointing about Christianity is that a number of other religions during their holy times, the, the, the Jews uh, just got through celebrating Hanukkah. And you see other religions. And those are the times where they really increase their giving. 